okay, so now you went from marijuana to cocaine and you're full blown in the cocaine game. Now with marijuana, it's relatively, you know, easy. People aren't really killing each other and robbing each other over right. marijuana. Right. But with cocaine, it's a slightly different game. There's more money, more profits, right. and the violence is usually escalated. So when you moved into cocaine, did things start to change in terms of your operation? Well, in terms of operation, it changed, just operating. But when when you have a certain reputation or you have a certain name, uh, violence and what you was just describing and things like that, it, it, it rarely comes. You know what I'm saying? Because it's just a respect level, I mean, from my experience, how you treat people. You know, you don't because... Now I was here first, and now I'm, I mean I may be up here, and now you, I treat you like a piece of shit, or you, you know you was once my friend because I'm up here now. It's 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 love, man. I mean mostly from my experience, from what I, you know, what I'm saying every now and then, people that you might not know or don't know you, it might be some problems here and there, man. But my mindset was always like, this is the business, we making money. This is what we here for. The the, the 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 violence and stuff, like I said, it's 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 uh something that you try to avoid at all costs. But you know, and it does it does come, it, it it will, and it does come. And then when it does, uh, you know, that's that's that you you know you 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 handle it how however you got to handle it. Okay, and everything was being run on Hanover Street at this point, right? Right. And. You guys actually had lookouts on hmm. the rooftops. Yeah. And when the police would come, there was a term that they would yell out. Right. And that was? Ola Raid. Right. And that means? That means the, the jump out is coming, which is the police. The police is coming. You know, so clean up, you know, get out the way, get in if you can. Move away from wherever the drugs that if they on the block, move over here. So if, if they jump right here and they find it, they can't pay them to put it on you and, you know, different things. But it, it mean they coming. The police coming. Right. And I guess Olare is roller in Pig Latin. Yeah, something like that. Or or, or they the Olare, both of them together. Is the, old, the police and is the raid coming. Uh, okay. So you're running this block and it's not like a typical DC block. I guess it's sort of like a one way street and you got to have to go right. through side streets to get to it and so forth. So it was somewhat insulated against the police and rival gangs and everything else like that. Right. 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 That was, that was a good thing. Yeah. Well, but at one point the police started to understand what was happening over there. Right. And this was around 1985 or so. Yeah, yeah, somewhere in the early 80s like that. Yeah, about there, probably. Okay, and once the police started to catch wind and started to go through, what started to change? Uh, well, I changed. I changed my operation. And uh, we got a house, and that changed the operation. That more insulated, well, at that point, I was no longer out there hand-to-hand, -hand, but I had workers. So now we got a house and that insulated them with being inside. So now you don't see them. Only the customer sees them when they step into this into the house or the vestibule part of the house. They don't actually go into the house. They get served and they leave. So the police start putting cameras up and they start doing a lot of things. So for the people who had to operate outside, they were, you know, like really had no cover, but we had cover. And that's so that's that's what changed as far as changing operation. By this time, 1985, before you moved, well, by the time that you moved to the house, were you getting busted by the police at all? Or were you still kind of under the radar? Yeah, I've, I've always never been busted by the police until, you know, but they, they knew who I were. They, they knew my name. They knew, but they, I never I never got busted. Up to this point, were there any seriously violent incidents that you had to go through in terms of your operation? There was a couple. There was a couple. Can you talk about it? Mm, not not really, but a couple of people uh, attempted a couple of things, you know, because uh, you still had guys who were just like up here in New York and other places, and they hear about your name, you know, and hear the, the stories about how much money you may have or what you're doing, uh, trying to pull, you know, kidnapping moves and different things, you know what I'm saying? Um, so, yeah, it was a couple of things that uh, – that I really don't want to get into, but 
Uh, yeah, I faced a lot of the same things other guys that was in the game uh, faced over some period of time, but just a couple. Fair enough. Fair enough. Now, was it around this time that you and Rayful Edmond met? Well, we had been met because we went to the same high school. That's where we met at, in high school. Got it. Mm-hmm. But was it around this time that you guys started to work together? No. Uh-uh. He had, uh, he had came through my block a few times, and I had noticed him. from. He didn't walk through. He had drive through with a couple other guys, and they looking, looking, you know. And I was just wondering, you know, but he was just came through looking at, at that point and observing things. So, but I didn't know what was what he was actually. I was just, you know, how you see people in summertime, people come through. Our street was always hustling, bustling, you know. So, yeah, that's how that that's how that was. Okay, so you go and you leave Hanover Street and set up your house, and then that next year in '86. Was that when crack hit Washington, D.C.? I had heard something. Well, they were saying freebasing at that time. I had heard something about it, and I didn't really know what it was. I think what Richard Pryor wanted us, somebody had a caught on fire, some things happened. One of these celebrities or something like that, and they were saying freebasing. I didn't know what, what the fuck that was, but come to find out, that's what they started. Well, that's what, it's, what he was supposedly doing. I guess it was the crack cocaine. And, uh, yeah, so that's when it, it kind of... Started, I started knowing about it somewhat. What changed in D.C. when it went from cocaine to crack? Uh, a whole lot changed. Um, money started coming faster, being made, you know, just you couldn't believe it how fast the shit was going, you know? You started seeing, you know, people more desperate concerning the, the, the drugs, uh, doing some more de more desperate things. And that, and that was to get the crack cocaine because, you know, it goes so fast when you get it, you need more. And you got to do, you know what I'm saying? So those are two major things that I really recognized that that uh, changed as far as the, the city and, and the drug game. Well, yeah, and there's, those next two years from 87 to 88, the murder rate in D.C. doubled. Um, yeah, I did leave that out. <laughs> yeah, but no, nah, it, it it did. It, it, it the violence started, you know. Um, go ahead. Well, yeah, I mean, I've interviewed a lot of people during this era from different cities. For example, I talked to Big U from the Rolling Sixties, and he said that right around this time is when you know, with the crack and the more money, the ammunition started to go up. So before people would have kind of you know twenty twos, nine millimeters. Suddenly they had Uzis and AK forty sevens and and so forth. Was well, that happening in DC as well? Well, we 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 already had that. We, I don't know what he twenty two. I don't remember none of that that small shit. Yeah, seriously. I'm just. I mean, we already. You know, not saying that you, you you had to use them or you use them, but it was just you 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 know I don't you know it was always was you know guns was always everywhere and. and and I guess in the world, you know, really. Um, but I know now is when the shit is really what he talking. That's that, for my opinion, that's when the heavy shit they got out there now. I ain't, you know, back then, I don't, you know, but yeah, now to me. So. Okay. So you're now building up your business and it's 1989. Are, are you and Rayful Edmund working together by this time or somewhat affiliated? Yeah, we making yeah we made a few we make made a few moves, um, yeah. You said eighty nine, right? Eighty nine. That's yeah, yeah what it were early eighty nine. That was our downfall. So you know before that we a few years before that we was you know made a few moves. Okay, and why did you decide to to start working more closely with Rayful? It didn't even start out like that. He came to me, uh, inquiring about he had known about me going to Las Vegas and. You know, taking my son and taking other guys that, you know, my friends and to, to to go and see fights and different things like that. And he was interested as far as taking him, him going and a couple of his men. And he was asking me, could I get him some tickets to go the next time that I went? So I, t I told him, I let me think about it. And, you know, I decided, yeah, I, I can get you some tickets. You can, We can go to get together. And, and that's what we did. And, you know, then, you know, we talked and we had some things went went from there from from that point. 